Um, so the first thing we started out by saying that we have no non perturbative uh, description mm -hmm. of string theory. And then yesterday it seemed like we wrote down something that was like a uh, path integral for strings. So that was a path integral. What was that? What I was giving yesterday was a formula to compute a single term in the perturbative expansion of string theory. So it was analogous to Feynman diagram in quantum field theory, an integral Feynman diagram. There is a way to write a. An action. There is something called string field theory that allows you to write down sort of an, an action from which you can derive this uh, perturbative expansion. But uh, is is it, it does not? I mean, nobody knows how to use that to to do anything non perturbative. Um, it's more like a sort of an effective action. Okay, so today I would like to focus on, uh, on the situation that is relevant to describing a single string propagating freely in, spa in space time. So instead of having a complicated Riemann surface, I want to focus just on one tube, on one cylinder, so a closed string propagating. Uh, so ultimately, the sort of information that we're going to derive from this picture uh, will allow us to, to find out what is the spectrum of string states. What sort of uh, excitations do you find in string theory? Uh, which sort of infinite tower of particles, if you want, uh, you find when you quantize a string? Now. In order to, to do calculations, I need to put some coordinate system on this cylinder. So let me just uh, pick a flat a set of flat coordinates. Uh, I mean, let's pick a flat metric on the cylinder. Uh, I can use coordinates, say, sigma and tau. So sigma is going to be identified uh, periodically because I want the cylinder. And tau is just going to uh, run from minus infinity to infinity. Now, I introduced here a length scale. Now, we know that the theory is while invariant. So the length scale shouldn't really matter. I keep it just because it, it, it will help me make a point at some point of the, of the lecture. And then I will just set it to 1. I'm going to use Euclidean, a Euclidean metric. So this tau here is Euclidean time. Now you might already immediately complain, why am I doing that? Uh, after all, the most natural metric I could think of putting on the, on the worksheet is the one in, uh, inherited from space-time, right? Which should be uh, Lorentzian, if my string is moving in space-time. <laughs> but uh, this question is completely analogous to uh, do I, in quantum field theory, do I use a Euclidean or a Lorentzia proper time when I do the calculations for the Feynman diagrams that I was showing you on the board? Uh, when I, in, the, when I, in the yesterday lecture, I used Euclidean uh, proper time. I could have used Lorentzia proper time. Uh, I will discuss these matters more carefully next week. Uh, for now, let's just say that calculation in Lorentzian quantum quantum field theory can anyway be derived from calculations of Euclidean quantum field theory by doing analytic, analytic continuation. Uh, so for now, let's just do calculations in, in Euclidean signature, which is simpler, uh, because you can use just standard complex geometry instead of whatever is the analog of complex geometry for Lorentzian space-time. But keep this question in mind. It's a, it's a good question. It's, not a silly, it's, it's a meaningful question. Uh, 
it becomes important when you ask things like, was the analog of an I epsilon prescription in string theory? So we will discuss it in detail, just not now. Uh, the action for, for that we were discussing yesterday, we described the motion of the of the of the string in space time uh, in a flat matrix. Looked like this. Here, U1 is, say, U1 is uh, uh, tau and U2 uh, is sigma. Now, this is really the sum of as many terms as dimensions you have in your space time. So, the, the field, the scalar fields are something like x0, x1, x2, all the way to xd. So uh, we can just focus for now on a single scalar field, on a single coordinate, which behaves like a scalar field in two dimensions. So I'm just going to denote it as x. And then later on in the lecture, I will just take 26 copies of them, or how many copies of them we need. Uh, finally, it's also useful to, re to remember the relation between Euclidean and Lorentzian time. And, and it's useful to also define a complex coordinate. Because as you recall, conformal transformations were most easily expressed in terms of complex coordinates. And this action becomes very simple written in terms of complex coordinates. Uh, so the action for a single scalar can be written uh, I want to get the sign right. Uh, Uh, essentially becomes proportional uh, to dx, d bar x. Okay, so... Hmm? Uh, why are we calling it a scalar theory with respect to what? Well... Uh, I have an action for some maps from two dimensions into uh, space time, into the space time of the string theory. From the point of view of the worksheet, each of these, these maps give you a collection of scalar fields. These are scalar fields on the worksheet. So, as I was saying yesterday, doing calculations on a or scattering amplitude in string theory of a single term. In the in this uh, in the photovoltaic expansion of scattering amplitude, requires you to do a two-dimensional quantum field theory calculation on the worksheet, where the fields are the positions in space-time, followed by an integral over the space of complex structures. So today we focus mostly on the two-dimensional quantum field theory calculation. That's actually hard. Um, more scalar fields. Right, so then here the number of scalar fields equals the number of dimensions of space time. But also multiplied by the hmm? I would just write down a term of the act, sorry, yeah, the action for, for one of these uh, scalar fields. That's right. And then if you many, many of them you just add up. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're contracting the A, B with this H, A, B. That's right. Uh, but the new indexes is of uh, 26 dimensions, right? 
I'm using a flat matrix in space time. That's a good with, point. With big rotation so, or without big rotation? Um, good point. With, 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 it's a Lorentz, I'm going to use a Lorentzian matrix in space time. But I will have to be extremely careful about what happens to the component x0 of my scalar field. So effectively, I will first treat this as it was a Euclidean coordinate in space time, and then I will weak rotate. So I write down, uh, so for now, see, because the, because for x, the, the sign of, of the action for x0 is, will be unusual. This is reflecting all sorts of uh, unpleasant things about the uh, commutation relations uh, and unitarity that we have to be careful with. Uh, this is somewhat analogous as when you, when you quantize electromagnetism. You need to be careful with the A0 component uh, of your connection, of your gauge field. But so for now, just let's focus on one scalar field. So you have seen canonical quantizations of three scalars. Uh, so I will not run through the extreme details of it. You, you take your scalar field, you expand it, say, at, at some fixed time. You expand it into Fourier modes. Uh, right? You perhaps look at the conjugate momentum, which is something like the tau derivative of x. And you expand it into Fourier modes as well. And then you impose canonical commutation relations. Uh, you write down your Hamiltonian if you want in terms of the of this degrees of freedom. Uh, you you discover that your field decomposes into a tower of harmonic oscillators, uh, except for the zero mode. So just uh, skipping some of those intermediate steps, let me just write a, a final answer, and then we can check if it's the correct answer. So I'm going to decompose the. Uh, the field into modes. So these A's and A bars are the, are the modes of these harmonic oscillators. The commutation relations look like this. Uh, So the A's and A bars are two independent sets of oscillators. Uh, depending on, on N being positive or negative, uh, these represent creation or annihilation modes for the harmonic oscillator. And on top of that, we have these two modes, X and P, which, are, which just satisfy the standard commutation relations of a, of a particle. They describe the, zero, the center of mass of your string. These are the, describe the central mass of the string. These describe the, the vibrational modes of the string. So the Hilbert, so if you want to check this expression, you could, uh, you, you can, for example, compute the equal time commutator. <laughs> 
fine. Uh, okay. The expected answer. So this is the conjugate momentum to the position to the, to the field. Okay. Do you have any questions about this expression? Mm -hmm. This is a real scalar field, right? Yes. So if we're using tau, but it, I can't see how it's real from this expression. It seems like the two ion LP tau term is something. Or is it only meant to be real once we rotate? Well, exactly. So when, whenever you say real, you really mean real in Lorentzian signature. Okay. So you can see this is really T. But it's complex for now. It's just a really bad idea to think of, to try to, to think in terms of real or complex okay. uh, Euclidean signature. Uh, you can still survive with bosonic fields whenever you try to think about fermions and you try to ask yourself, is this fermion real or complex in Euclidean signature? You will get into infinite amount of confusion. Uh, so this is the weak rotation of a real <laughs> scalar if you want. If I send it up, is it still visible? Not. I think I will not send it up for now. Um, mm -hmm. okay. Right? Well, I have a question. What's with the 4 pi i in the computation relation for x and pi? Uh, I could have put. I could divide it by, by four pi's, the definition. Uh, it does convention. Okay, so, so I have my modes, and I can then now describe the Hilbert space of the, of the theory compatible on the circle. So. The Hilbert space is going to be a Fox space. Uh, for the for the oscillators. Meaning that some of these will annihilate a certain vacuum, and some of them will build on the vacuum to construct the Tauro states. Uh, for the zero modes, I just had the same uh, Hilbert space as for a free particle on, uh, for, on, a, on, on, on the real line. So the Fox space will, will include a bunch of eigenvalues to the momentum, or the center of mass momentum. And then things built of them by turning on harmonic oscillators. Statement clear? Why are you only taking negative n? Well, as I said, a, if you look at, say, a1 and a minus 1, the commutation relations a1, a minus 1 equal to 1. So you recognize, if you compare this with harmonic oscillator, you recognize that this is a crea creation operator and this is a destruction operator. So this state had the property that a n on p vanishes if n is uh, greater than zero, and and also a bar n vanishes. So it's a standard Fox space, just that there are infinitely many 
I mean, oscillators. Uh, and I can write also a bunch of dual states. Now, the dual states are going to be any key. Uh, so I have, of course, as usual, some delta function normalis normal. These are delta function normalizable states, as usual. And these dual states are going to be annihilated by a n and a bar n, where n is negative. So whenever you want to compute some inner product in this Fox space, say I want to compute uh, the inner product between P, A1, and A minus 1, P prime, what you do is you simply commute them across so that you bring this to Q, uh, P prime, using the commutation relations. And you get your inner product. Similarly, whenever you want to act on this state with some operator, if you, if you have a destruction operator, you acting on a state, you had to commute it across all the modes until it kills the vacuum. Is everybody familiar with so, this sort of uh, with Fox spaces? Uh, and how to do calculations with them. OK. So there are a few observations which are in order. The first observation, uh, yes, the first observation is that if you take an holomorphic derivative of x, you get a pretty nice expression. So the holomorphic derivative of x, it's an holomorphic function. This follows from the fact that the equations of motion are just del del bar x. So which means del bar x is anti-holomorphic, and del x is holomorphic. So what's going on is that x, if you see, is just a sum of an holomorphic and an anti-holomorphic function. Similarly, the S, S bar x is anti-homorphic. Because of, sorry, 1 over L times P, sorry. So uh, because of these expressions, it's, it's actually convenient to define uh, A0 to be P and a zero bar to be minus p. This gives you more uniform formula. So if you do that, then the a's are just the modes of this uh, object, and a bars are the Fourier modes of this object. Now, uh, a free scalar, free massless scalar, has a very simple symmetry. Uh, you can translate the scalar by a constant amount, and that doesn't change the action. Right. Uh, now, can somebody tell me what the current for this symmetry is? The energy momentum tensor is a current for translations of, of on your space time. Right. On, on, sorry. Here, unfortunately, there are two, two, no, two things we can mean for space time. Here we're discussing the two dimensional theory living on the worksheet. So, uh, 
There is a notion of stress tensor on the worksheet, which is the next thing we're going to discuss. But that has to do with shifting tau or sigma, not with shifting x. So how would you write? So on the, in this two-dimensional theory, there is a current, two-dimensional current associated to this symmetry. Um, how would it look like? X, yes, the that's correct. So the, the, the Ix is the current. So the current has two components, dx and the, the bar x. Now, normally, current conservation would tell you that the S bar derivative of this uh, equals the S derivative of this, pretty much. Uh, sorry, S bar derivative is plus S derivative of this equals to zero, which is true because of the equations of motion. Uh, but what happens here is that actually the individual components of the current are separately conserved. This is a special thing that tends to happen a lot in two-dimensional conformal field theory. Uh, it's, it's associated to the fact that this this theory actually has a much larger symmetry, which is just shift x by any holomorphic function or by any antilomorphic function. You can easily convince yourself that this transformation does not change the action. Um, so this is related to the fact that uh, if you multiply so the, the current for this, sorry, it was S and S bar. The current for this symmetry looks like this, F of S del S and G of S bar del bar X. So for all these currents to be conserved for every F and G, uh, the fact that these are all conserved follows from the fact that this is holomorphic and this is antihomorphic. Now, this is not a terribly deep uh, statement. I mean, in any free theory, you can always shift your fields by a solution of the equation of motion, just because the equation of motion are, are linear. So free theories always come with infinitely many uh, symmetries. But what's, uh, what's nice in two-dimensional conformal field theory is that this sort of principle applies more generally to, to other things. Uh, which we'll encounter momentarily. But it's just to say that you can think about these modes as uh, conserved charges for some symmetries. See, to get a conserved charge, you integrate the current against uh, on space, right? So if I, want, if I look at a symmetry where, fa where x is shifted by e to the i and uh, s over l, e to the ns over l, I would just look at the current e to the ns over l, d s x, and integrate it uh, from sigma equal to 0 to 2 pi l, the sigma. Right? And if you do that, you get exactly an OK. So uh, the, only, the, the last thing I will need about this uh, scalar field is to compute some simple correlation function. So suppose I take some state here, uh, some states, and a sandwich in between showed these currents. Actually, for simplicity, let me take the vacuum to some of these states. So 
you can just compute it by inserting this inside here and using results like that. So you will find something like this. So what happens is that essentially only the modes of only the ANs with negative n in here contribute because the others kill this vacuum, and only the mod, only the ANs with positive n contribute here because the others kill the kill the state at infinity, uh, kill the state in the future, and so you get a sum of this sort, which you can just it's a geometric series. And you get this following answer, the following answer. Now, this answer has a divergence when the location of this operator approaches the location of this operator. Mm -hmm. Sorry, how did you define the state P? Uh, sorry, <laughs> silly me. I forgot to write. P, P, equal to. Uh, they are again, they are again, again vectors for the momentum operator of the zero mode. Okay. So, and sorry, here there was supposed to be a delta function, delta P. Because these are delta function normalizable states. If I if I had done if I had put a p prime here, I would have had an extra term in this sum involving a zero squared. So I would have just had an extra p squared added to the whole thing. Now, can you guess how does how does the divergence look like? as S approaches S prime. Prime approaches S. You did conform. You did conform a field theory, right? I'm being very careful not to use the language of OPEs here, but maybe you might remember what was the OPE of uh, the phi, the x. We will call it the phi. Uh, so, well, you see here, there is something that goes like s minus s prime squared. Uh, the factors fail cancel out. So this is the divergence. Now the reason I needed this calculation is that I want to define the stress tensor, the two-dimensional stress tensor. So So the two-dimensional stress tensor is defined uh, just as the variation of the action with respect to the metric, right? Once I go into to flat metric, and remember, this is conserved. Right? Once I go to a flat metric um, and encompass coordinates, the classical stress tensor simplifies a lot. So if I lower the indices, I get the TSS is just minus one half ds phi, ds phi, ds x squared, and TS bar as bar is just minus one half ds bar x squared, while T of S as bar vanishes. <laughs> 
The reason this vanishes is that this is also the same as the trace of the stress tensor. You can convince yourself easily that in a violin variant theory, the stress of the stress tensor should vanish. Just because a vial transformation is just a variation of the metric proportional to the metric itself. Now, if in the quantum theory, an expression like that makes no sense, right? Because we cannot bring multiply two operators at the same position. Uh, a good physical way to define it is use, some, is use regularization like point splitting regularization, or you keep your operators slightly separated from each other, you subtract off the divergence, and then you send them together. So a good point splitting definition of the stress tensor would be something like that, TSS, which is usually just called T. I'm sorry for the confusion between T here and T that was the tension. Uh, forget about that T for now. Uh, this is just the conventional, the standard convention in, uh, conf in conformal field theory. So I define it as minus one half the limit as S prime approaches S of dsx of S, ds prime x of S prime plus one over S minus S prime squared. Now here there is a very important point. There is some freedom in deciding what I subtract off. In principle. But there is a one, one point that you should always keep in mind. Quantum field theory should be local. Locality is a very important property of quantum field theory. If you break locality, you lose all, a lot of good properties. So whatever you subtract off can only depend on what's going on in the neighborhood of S. For example, if you're trying to define a stress tensor on a space-time with a complicated metric, what you subtract here can be some function of the metric and its derivatives at that position. It cannot be a function, say, of the area of the manifold. It cannot depend on some properties of the manifold of space-time far away from, from your location. In particular, in this setup, it cannot depend on L. So you could, you could have thought that perhaps I, sh I should just subtract off this whole thing in my definition. That would have been the normal ordering prescription, where you sort of subtract off the vacuum expression value of your, of your, of your uh, product. Uh, but it's not okay, because this depends on the, on the size of the cylinder. So you cannot do that. So your definition of the stress tensor cannot be the normal ordering prescription unless you are in flat space, it really on, in, in R2. Because in actual, the, the expectation value of, of dx dx is going to be exactly this. So this is, this is essentially the only reason I was carrying along L to demonstrate the fact that what to subtract off cannot be this whole expression, but it has to be this. Uh, OK, now we can use this point splitting regularization. Uh, to do some calculations. Now, actually, right. For example, suppose that I want to compute now the expectation value of the stress tensor between two states. So I need to take the limit as S prime goes to S of one half of Minus one half of minus one over L squared e to the one over L s plus s prime over e to the s over L minus e to the s over L squared um, plus one over s minus s prime squared. And there is the delta p that just goes along for the ride. So now computing, and so this, the, the, the interesting point is that this limit is non-trivial. It's not zero. Uh, 
So if you take the S to S prime limit of this expression, the divergent part cancels out, but the constant part does not. And the answer is uh, minus 1 over 24 L squared uh, delta of B. So in particular, the stress tensor tells, among other things, the amount of energy in a state. This is telling you that the vacuum on a cylinder has non-zero energy. This is called Casimir energy. It turns out that the Casimir energy is closely re related to the, to the Weyl anomaly. So the fact that there is a 1 over 24 here uh, is actually the, the first sign of the Weyl anomaly of, the, of one scalar field is 1, uh, as a coefficient proportional to 1. But uh, I'll discuss this better uh, later on. OK, so not, notice that um, we can use these, these expressions, right? plug them in this, into this definition, and get the Fourier expansion for the stress tensor. Mm -hmm. so, so can you still set R to 1 if you have this anomaly? Yes, yes, it's fine. Because the anomaly means that the symmetry is broken. Right. So it turns out that so the anomaly means that the symmetry is, is broken. But uh, so if I if I were to write down the precise statement, so I can measure the breaking of the symmetry by the fact that the stress tensor is not traceless. Because you can you can prove easily that if the stress tensor is traceless, the theory is exactly uh, so the quantum stress tensor. So the classical stress tensor is a variation of the action with respect to the metric. The quantum stress tensor includes the variation of the measure, too. In this case, so this is what this is about, really. So while invariance is a statement that the quantum stress tensor is traceless. Now, if you compute, if you take the theory of a scalar field and you compute the quantum stress tensor on a manifold with a with, on a on a worksheet with generic metric, you'll find an expression like this. You'll say that the stress tensor is proportional, that the trace of the stress tensor is proportional to the Ricci curvature of this metric. So now it just so happened that if your worksheet is literally flat, uh, you don't see this. So the, the lack of while invariance becomes visible when, you, when your watch it is not globally flat. So as long as it's work on the cylinder, we are not going to see uh, the breaking of while symmetry. At least not in an easy way. But you can see traces of it, which I will uh, discuss in a moment. So what I wanted to do was to expand the stress tensor into Fourier modes. So if you use this definition, you get an expression like this. Uh, I will set L equal to 1 from now on. OK, so if you, if you do the calculation carefully, you get this sort of following Fourier expansion. There are these Fourier modes, which are sort of the normal, the most naive normal ordering way to uh, combine Fourier modes of the shoe of the LX and the LX. And then there is this correction due to the fact that the definition is not normal order. Um, now, if you feel cavalier, uh, you could have computed this minus uh, 1 over 24 uh, using something like zeta function regularization, meaning if, 
in your typical textbook, what they do is that they do the calculation naively without regularization. Then they find something like an expectation value of sum of, of a sum of A's, not like expectation value of sum of expectation value of A n, A minus n, uh, which gives them a sum of n, literally. Okay. And then they say this is minus 112. Uh, this works typically if you do things right. You, it's very easy to get the wrong answers doing it. But the correct way is to give a physical definition of the stress tensor and define the energy as the intensity of the stress tensor. So that's the correct way to understand Casimir energy. So the energy, you, you, in quantum mechanics, there is no zero for the energy, right? You could just shift the energy by a constant and nothing bad happens, right? So you could ask yourself, why is the Casimir energy a well-defined notion? The point is that in a relativistic theory, the energy is associated with, must be associated to a local conserved stress tensor. That's, that actually sets a, a, is a more constraining notion. So writing, so the correct way to compute the energy of the vacuum, right, is to, comp, to first define a, a nice stress tensor with a local definition, which is conserved, and then use that to measure the energy. Which is what we did here. Uh, in, terms, in terms of these modes, uh, for T and for T bar, uh, I'm sorry. Then the the energy is just L zero plus L zero bar minus one twelve, and the momentum momentum on the watch sheet, not to be confused with the momentum p uh, conjugate to the center of mass position of the scalar field. So I use a cap I use a capital P. I hope it's distinguishable from a little p. Uh, the momentum is L zero minus L zero bar. So, uh, what's the energy of the state? These are the definitions, they're on the board. Because this is normal ordered, only A0 squared matters. So L0 acting on P gives me minus, sorry, gives me just one half P squared. L0 acting on A minus 1, P, uh, can be computed in the same way. You get something like 1 half P squared plus 1, and so on and so forth. Sort of every, so A minus 1 raises L0 by 1. A minus 2 raises L0 by 2. A minus 1 bar raises L0 bar by 1. A minus 2 bar raises L0 bar by 2. So here, when I depicted my Fox space, I put, I, I organized it in terms of the energy of the states. So this is energy P squared minus 112. This is energy P squared minus 112 plus 1. Same here. It has P squared minus 112 plus 2, and so on and so forth. <coughs> on the other hand, this has, zero, has no worksheet momentum, because both L0 and L0 bar are the same. This has one unit of worksheet momentum. This has minus one unit of worksheet momentum, and so on and so forth. 
Could you just lower that board in front? Hmm? Could you lower the board that's in front there for a second? Uh, uh, lower it, <laughs> if possible. Ah, lower it more? Sorry. Yeah. So, um, when you... So, what I don't understand is the in the definition of E, or mm -hmm. in the expression for E, Yes. L0 plus L0 bar. Ah, yes, what was that board? Mm -hmm. so yes. So why does L0 bar not act on P? What do you mean, act on P? Like, so, we, we, so, mm -hmm. so, what, so what's the total energy of the state P? So it receives a contribution p square over true from this, yeah. little p, yeah. square, p square over true from here, oh, okay. minus 112. Okay. Because remember, both a0 and a0 bar are equal to p. Okay. And L0 starts at 1 half a0 squared. Okay. So finally, uh, we could try to compute the algebra of these Fourier modes. So how do I compute the commutator of two, of two L's? Uh, if you try to use directly these expressions, you're going to get infinite sums again, infinite divergent sums again. Um, and you have to try to use it as a function of regularization or something like that. But the correct way to do it is to first ask yourself, how does L act on the fields? And then Fourier expand that. So you need to do sort of three calculations. First, you ask, how does Ln act on x? This is a neat calculation. Um, you, you just use this expression and act on and commit it across this. Right. And you get a very intuitive answer. You get something like uh, e to the ns ds x. So uh, why does this make sense? Well, so t originally. So the stress tensor is always the generator of translations. Right? It's the concert current associated to translations of the worksheet. But here, something magical happened, analogous to what happened to the concert current for translations of x. Although the divergence of the stress tensor, strictly speaking, should just be that, the individual components of the stress tensor are separately conserved. This is, until, this is holomorphic. This is anti-holomorphic. So you have a del bar TSS equal to 0, and del S TS bar S bar equal to 0. Right? So that means that I can multiply the stress tensor again by any function of S. And I still get a conserved current, which means I get conserved charges by just taking Fourier modes of it. So the LNs are again conserved charges for some symmetries. What are these symmetries? The symmetries are just uh, conformal transformations. Mm -hmm. I don't understand. Can you explain again why LN are symmetries? Because ln, what is ln? ln is just the Fourier mode of the stress tensor, right? So it's a contour integral of sigma equal to 0 to 2 pi of phi to the ns, t of ss. But that's the conserved charge for this conserved current. So what are, do, what are these symmetries doing? They are just coordinate transformations. s goes to s plus epsilon e to the ns. These are holomorphic coordinate transformations. Remember, holomorphic coordinate transformations leave the metric combined with the wild transformation, 
leave the metric unchanged, leave the theory, leave the action unchanged. So this is definitely a symmetry. You know, I map x of s to x of s plus epsilon uh, e to the n s. This does not change the act. The, does not change the action. This is the symmetry generated by a lens, and you can see it here, right? The, the infinitesimal change of x is precisely this vector field acting on x. So now, with a bit more patience, you can ask how does ln acts on dsx of s, dsx of s prime of s prime. Right? There is no difficulty doing this. this these are operators are separate, separate points. I'm just committing L across this and across this. Right? So that's a very simple expression. And then you can apply your point splitting definition and derive what, what, what does L, how does L act on T. And you find something interesting. So if you replace, if you just ignored these extra terms that come from uh, doing the proper regularization, this would just be the standard way a, a tensor transforms under, uh, well, conformal transformations. So you do a coordinate transformation like that, a scalar field transforms like this, but the tensor gets an extra power of the Jacobian in front. So this is just what this 2n is. It's a correction due to the Jacobian squared. But we get these extra corrections. So the stress tensor does not quite behave like a tensor under conformal transformations. Uh, How do you infer that from here? Hmm? How do you infer that it is not a tensor from here? Well, because. And just this is the this is by definition how a tensor transforms under a coordinate transformation. So if I have extra terms, it means that the stress tensor does not behave like a tensor. So it's a coordinate like a transformation of S, a transformation of S. Yes, I map S to S plus a small uh, multiple of e to the n S. Um, could you explain again how this? So, I actually don't understand why that is how you expect a, trans a tensor to transform. Well, how does a tensor, so if I do a change of coordinate, right, I just take my original tensor, write s as a function of s prime, but I also need, there are these, I need to deal with the indices, right? So I also need to multiply by the s over the s prime squared. Now take S prime to do this. Uh, so you do the infinitesimal version of that. And you get this expression. See, this is just a change of coordinate, and this is just the coordinate. The fact that there is a true here is the fact that it's a square of the Jacobian. See, the, 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 what is the Jacoba is that. <laughs> 1 plus epsilon n e to the n s, right? Squared t of s plus epsilon e to the n s. So expand this in a deleting order in epsilon, you get precisely this. But why is that the, like, why should that be the commutator of Because ln implements these transformations. So the fact that there are corrections means that the stress tensor doesn't quite behave like a tensor. Uh, 
Now, this is definitely a manifestation of, of, the, uh, of the fact that wild symmetry is broken in the sense that, as I said, to see the wild, wild anomaly, you need to put an non-trivial metric on your manifold, okay, instead of flat metric. Well, if, if you have a metric which is infinitesimally close to the flat metric, that's the same as just inserting your stress tensor in a correlation function. Insert your stress tensor, multiply it by the variation of the metric, and integrate. But the variation of the metric is a ten. So, so this, this expression is invariant only if t is a tensor. Because the variation of the metric, if I change coordinates, right, just changes by the Jacobian. So these extra terms are telling you correlation functions, if my metric is not flat, will not be invariant under wild transformations. So in particular, for a general theory here, you find the uh, sort of uh, the central charge that I was discussing. So the fact that you have a one here is the way you see that this theory has uh, central charge one. If you then take the, this expression and you uh, fully expand it further, you find finally the commutator between the uh, modes of the stress tensor. So this is called the Virasoro algebra. If, this, if you didn't have this term, this would just be the, the, the algebra of vector fields you know, of diffeomorphisms of, of your surface, right? This is, this, 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 if I just take the Poisson bracket, right, between the, the vector fields e to the ns ds and e to the ms ds, uh, you just get precisely this. So if I take the commutator of two coordinate transformations, I would naively get this. But the actual algebra is a form as a consequence of the wild anomaly. It's centrally extended, more precisely. So this is called the Virasoro algebra. So you say that you want to construct a local theory, but mm -hmm. in some sense, the correlators already know that about the global topology. Sure. The correlators can know about global topology is the definition of the operators that cannot know about the global, global topology. Why? Why the, why the correlators can know about it? Well, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's not clear for me why if you... Uh, like the, if I mean, you can definitely define operators which are not local. Mm -hmm. They're free to do so. But those operators have properties which are less nice than operators which are local. For example, if I have two operators that are non-local, the correlation function of these operators might diverge even if the operators are not at zero distance from each other. So, uh, yeah, for example, when you, co when you compute a correlation function mm -hmm. using the path integral, yes. so the, the operator that you're going to put in the path integral is local. Yes. When you sum over all... That's right. The, answer, the correlation functions obviously know about okay. space-time. But it's the questions I want to ask. So what are operators? Operators are the questions I can ask my theory as a definition of operator. And it's useful to consider the definition of local operator is questions which only depend on the neighborhood of, of space-time. And it's useful to think about local operators, they think. But uh, in a sense, quant a lot of the axioms about quantum field theory are about how local operators behave and which properties do they have. Uh, like, for example, the very basic property you want is that the questions I can ask at this point should be independent from the questions I can ask at this point. This is pretty much the definition of quantum field theory. Quantum field theory is a, is a physical theory where I can ask completely independent questions at each point of space-time. Um, so 
so the list of local questions is important. Uh, and have special properties as opposed to questions that involve a whole patch of space time. Uh, for example, if you define a stress tensor in a local way, it will satisfy the nice property that uh, in a correlation function, So this is supposed to satisfy word identities, right? Mm -hmm. Which are, so it's not exactly zero, but it fails to be zero only at the location of the other operators. If, my, if I define my stress tensor in a non-local way, I will probably lose this. Okay, are there any more questions about, about this? So in, in determining the string spectrum, which we'll do a little bit by hand at the beginning of the next lecture, we mostly need the description of this Fox space and the definition of energy and momentum of a state. Because uh, what we need to do is sort of take 20 D copies of these scalar fields, and then impose what we're called the constraint that came from gauge fixing. It's called the Virasoro constraint. The van classically, the, the, sta the classical statement is that the stress tensor vanishes in a solution. Then you need to understand how to express the quantum mechanically, but I thought we'll, we'll do it a bit by hand in the next lecture, impose the Virasoro constraint, and see which states reserve the constraint. Uh, and then we'll find the spectrum of strings. Any more questions? Okay.